off to Amy and Jennifer this morning. Thank you all. Great, thanks, Sean. Hi, everybody. Jake Tysinger, uh, Senior Energy Advisor with Franklin Energy. Uh, gonna go through uh, some of the today's learning objectives and agenda. So the learning objectives for today, uh, when you finish this training, we'd like for you to have learned how the 2022 energy code has been reorganized from previous versions. We're going to review high level changes that have been made to the 2022 energy code, uh, focusing today on how it impacts multifamily residences. And then we'll learn some of the specific changes that have been made uh, as they apply to multifamily residences, specifically the three sections of mandatory measures, uh, the performance and prescriptive approaches, and additions and alterations. This is our second of three uh, trainings focusing on the three uh, main sections of the 2022 code. Uh, we delivered the single family project training back on March 1st, if any of you attended. If you didn't attend, that is now um, available on the, Bay, on the 3C REN uh, webpage, including the slides and recording. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the multifamily projects. And in just a couple days, uh, March 17th, uh, we'll focus on the non-residential projects. And again, the URL listed below um, will take you directly to the calendar of events and trainings. So today's agenda, we'll start by walking through the Energy Code a triennial cycle. Uh, then we'll focus on the reorganization of the code. We'll get into the high level changes as they impact multifamily residential buildings, and then go into the mandatory, mandatory measure code changes, the performance and prescriptive approaches, and additions and alter alterations. And at the end, there will be time for questions and answers. Um, but as uh, Ian mentioned in the beginning, if you have questions that come up during, please do use the, the chat function and submit those. Uh, we'll, we'll bring those up as they make sense to do so throughout the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll start to talk about the Energy Code Triennial Cycle. So the California Energy Commission um, does update the California Energy Code every three years. That's why it's called the triennial cycle. The process includes engagement with the public, uh, industry experts, in-house expertise, and other stakeholders. For this latest 2022 uh, set of updates, uh, the big picture goals uh, that you'll notice, uh, there's a lot more focus on encouraging heat pump technology uh, for both space and water heating. The code does establish electric ready requirements for single family homes. It also expands the PV system and battery storage standards and strengthens the ventilation standards. Today's presentation will focus on the 3C REN Tri-County region. Uh, that includes San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Uh, the climate zones listed here, four, five, six, nine, and 16. And these are based on the uh, climate zones as identified under the building energy efficiency standards. There are 16 of them total and we'll cover um, just about a third of them. What you need to know is that uh, any project that applies for a permit on or after January 1st, 2023 will fall under the 2022 code that we're covering. Uh, that's when this code goes into effect. If you want to dig into the full set of documents, um, looking into uh, both the current code and the 2022 code and a, a difference, uh, the differences and edits that are made along the way, and they can be found at this URL here, um, but they're organized um, very well on the 3 c REN website at this uh, URL you see. Um, we found it very helpful to go through the uh, express terms and final express terms when uh, compiling the content in today's presentation. So if there's anything you see and you want to, to dig in deeper, visit the site, uh, take a look. And of course, uh, any questions along, along the way that can't be answered, um, you can use the Energy Code Coach uh, function and, and reach one of us to help answer your questions. 
So now we'll go into the energy code uh, reorganization. The subchapters in the 2019 code that you may be familiar with, um, the all buildings section, sections 100 and 110, um, differentiated between the buildings, primarily focusing on high rise and low rise. Um, the high rise section included non-residential buildings, hotel, motel, and the low rise um, residential section uh, was the other main section. In 2022, uh, the main difference that you'll see is that a new section has been added uh, for multifamily buildings. So you maintain the non-residential um, and hotel motel sections, as well as the single family residential section uh, that includes duplexes and townhouses. And there's also a new section, the multifamily building section. And so a lot of uh, the changes and updates we'll talk about today do come from this new section. Uh, we've shown here how the subchapters sub were organized in the 2019 uh, version of the energy code with the low rise and non and not low rise sections effectively being the main two differences. In 2022, as you'll see, um, there's the single family res section in the middle there, everything that's considered not residential on the far left. And then the new um, sections uh, under underneath the multifamily residential. And again, today's presentation really will focus on these multifamily residential changes and the new chapter. And with that, I will hand it over to Jennifer to start to go through the high-level changes and the multifamily residence sections. Jennifer. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, let's. Thank you. Move right into that slide. Um, the multifamily, um, Jake did a, a really described that we've got these different categories now for multifamily. And a lot of what is in the multifamily really is coming from uh, the residential standards and some of those changes on the single family residential where it's applicable have been pulled into this, these new sections and then updates that were applicable to the non-res sections were pulled into this new section. So in a way, everything that we show you is a change. It's new because the sections are new. However, there's so much material now in looking at all the detail in those sections. Amy and I are gonna go through and try and pull out what the most salient features are and the biggest changes that would impact you. And a lot of the changes under the previous code, just in general, when something is brought in and used in a couple of code cycles, a lot of times those things will go into becoming a mandatory measure. And that's true for this coming up code change. Um, next slide. I wanna go over a little bit of vocabulary because this will come up as we're talking and we also color coded the slides for you. So mandatory requirements are the energy efficiency measures that are applicable to all projects, but they're, you have to do them no matter what. They're like a baseline minimum. And then under the performance method, it is essentially a computer modeling approach and it allows for trade-offs. You still have to do the mandatory measures, but you can now trade off other components or other measures to come up with an energy uh, performance that beats a standard baseline. That standard baseline is based on the prescriptive method. And in a, the prescri I'm not sure on my screen if you've clicked it. I think there might be a lag, so I'm so sorry, you guys. On the prescriptive component package, the mandatory measurements are still applicable, um, but now you have to follow essentially a checklist. It's kind of like a recipe card. On the performance method, you can change the recipe a little bit and improve it if you want, but otherwise in the performance, I mean, prescriptive method, you follow the recipe exactly. Okay, next slide, a couple of more terms. Time-dependent valuation is the metric used in the California Energy Code, and that 
has been consistent over all the code cycles, and that's what's used in the performance method for the computer modeling. Uh, TDV has multipliers in it that is based on the time of day that the energy is used, and that directly ties to the power generation and uh, transmission and distribution losses for creating that energy, that electricity typically, but it's also true for propane, natural gas, creating that energy and getting it to your site. Now, we're gonna add in another metric called source energy, and this source energy metric is basically a proxy for determining the impact of carbon emissions. So California is working hard to reduce energy, but really there are, our whole state wants to reduce our impact on greenhouse gas emissions and the source energy is gonna be a proxy for that. So when you do the performance method, you'll have to comply with the TDV energy budget and comply with the source energy budget. Okay, next slide. Um, now the source energy and the TDV energy, it includes aspects for battery storage and solar PV. And those two items were added into the metric. So we still have ventilation, water heating, indoor lighting, et cetera, but now we've, and certain covered process loads, but now we've added these other two elements. And both of these will have to comply. So your whole building complies. Next slide. The one thing that um, probably to really mm, kind of take away from this is understanding that the source energy is a proxy for carbon. And also that as an update in this code cycle, some of the climate zones, many of them now are using heat pumps in the baseline. And so that's going to affect your performance method modeling and heat pumps are being encouraged essentially in the code through using these in the baseline. Okay, next slide. Now I'm going to go into a few of the mandatory measures that um, have been updated. Category 110.0 through 110.12, a lot of that, the first section, it does definitions. And then after that, it goes into appliances and heating and cooling equipment. And a lot of the efficiencies have been improved. So now just even if the other parts of the code don't change, the fact that you're now needing to use more energy efficient equipment is really important. And a lot of these changes are for larger pieces of equipment. So that's going to be more applicable to the non-res and common res spaces, or if your multifamily project is using a central system. Otherwise, for just individual heating and cooling, individual dwelling unit heating and cooling systems, you probably won't notice much change there. Okay, next slide. I just want to point out that the section 110.0F did clarify which parts of the code are applicable to um, to this section and basically pointing out that for these new multifamily sections, you're gonna have two types of occupancies. One is the residential dwellings, and then you're gonna have the non-residential spaces. And you're gonna have all of this now fall under these two sections, however, if you do have a building, for example, a multifamily building, we're, Amy and I were talking about this morning, she said, hey, Jennifer, what if you've got a multifamily building, a lot of uh, support spaces, but you've got this one little retail, like let's say it's like a little uh, sundry center or grocery, grocery area that operates separately. If that area is, less than 20%, you can include it in your whole building and just make sure that you meet the lighting requirements for retail. And that's that was true previously, code cycles, and it's still true. So I want to point that out. Okay, next slide. This new section, 160, is divided up 
into several sections. And the sections that are highlighted or bolded are the ones we're going to mainly hit on today for the mandatory measurements, because a lot of the other sections had very little change. So it might look familiar to you. A lot of these topics follow quite closely to the non-residential standards. The one section that is new is the electric building section, which is down at the bottom, point nine. And again, the non-residential occupancies will comply with the non-residential requirements and our residential occupancies will comply with these new uh, multifamily residential sections with, with an overlap because it's uh, in the code, as you'll see in Amy section two, they do, we do address the kind of high rise portions of the buildings that we used to think of as non-residential but they are residential and now they're all being included together. So the idea is to simplify the compliance for multifamily projects. Next. Just to kind of reiterate a little bit of that, the attached dwelling units are gonna be, are largely following the residential code and that does follow with the real closely with three habitable stories or less, you're going to see the residential appendices for um, for like hers measures, and then the other spaces that are non-dwelling units. You're gonna it follows very closely with the non-res code, and for the four or more habitable stories, you're going to see the non-residential appendices and follow those for the hers measure, measures. And as a reminder. Um, this is not applicable to townhouses or dwellings that contain two units. Okay, if you click this next things, then yeah, they'll show the red kind of grouping, sort of the res still with three stories or less and the non-res or the non-dwelling um, unit spaces would still be coming under kind of the non-res uh, standards. Okay, next slide. The indoor air quality, there's been a couple of changes here that I'm gonna point out. And essentially ASHRAE 62.2 still is the baseline for dwelling units and ASHRAE 62.1 is still the baseline for the common space or non-dwelling units. And there has been some changes in the dwelling units to improve the indoor air quality, specifically with how uh, fans are integrated, how we exhaust our kitchen and bathroom, and there's now a new prescriptive way to deal with ventilation duct sizing that is mandatory, but you can show it prescriptively. And also we now have new code language to address balanced ventilation and heat recovery. Okay, next. Real quick on this one, I just want to point out that there's been some new code language to clarify how you can use a central, your central air handler to comply with the indoor air quality and bring in fresh air. And just to run the fan continuously, you're still not allowed to do that, but there are things you could do to the equipment and it clarifies that you can use this system if you want to, both single family and multifamily. Next. One part of the code now that's been clarified or additions is they specifically addressed what you need to do for local mechanical exhaust when you have a non-enclosed or an open kitchen versus an enclosed kitchen and enclosed bathrooms. Um, ventilation systems that are part of energy or heat recovery ventilation uh, can be used. There is a new element of the code, however, that clarifies that the balanced ventilation system needs to have a fan efficacy of less than one watt per CFM. And just to point out, this part is true, true in the new code and was true on the old code, is that you can turn these fans off if you need to, but they do need to be labeled that the switch controls the indoor air quality ventilation for the home or the dwelling, and 
to leave it on at all times unless the air outdoor air quality is very poor. So if we're having local fires, for example, you can turn the system off and keep the smoke out of your apartment. Okay, next. The kitchen range hood now has a new performance metric. There's only a couple labs in our in our uh, in California or well in the western states right now that test the kitchen hoods but soon we're going to be seeing this what's called a um, capture efficiency and you'll be able to choose the kitchen hood or show that it meets code by its capture efficiency if it's rated and I created an illustration on the right for you just to give you an idea of what that looks like and the idea is you know, capture efficiency of 55% would take up 55% of all the elements that are coming off of that cooking appliance. And there is a difference between the natural gas range and over an electric range, which would include induction. And the values are less over the electric range. So it has been shown scientifically that when you cook with natural gas, you need to have a higher capture efficiency, a higher CFM in order to produce the same good indoor air quality for that space because a uh, gas stove does give off a lot higher uh, pollution into an apartment or a house. Next. The bathrooms can be exhausted either with a continuous uh, mechanical system or an intermittent mechanical system. That part is true on the code. However, what we've added now is that the installer or hers um, on the low rise, they have to come in and prove or show that these elements, uh, these exhaust fan meet the code. So on the right, I, gave, I showed a picture of what some of those pieces of equipment might look like, their range and price. If, you're, um, if you do this kind of testing and you're not familiar, or rather if you're going to be doing this kind of testing or you're thinking about that in terms of your client's projects, um, the equipment's about $1,200 to be able to test these. Or if you don't want to do that active kind of testing, now prescriptively you can follow this pattern of minimum duct diameter and total length and no more than three elbows, et cetera, et cetera, and sort of follow the recipe. And then that can be done as a visual inspection. Okay, next slide. When it comes to the dwelling unit lighting, uh, essentially not much has changed other than there's been some clarification on what qualifies as an energy efficient light fixture and the joint appendices that provides the qualification for the requirements have been updated. And probably the two kind of minor changes, the California Electric Code is greater alignment or the energy code is greater alignment with the electric code and um, recess luminaires now need to meet some new requirements for the common service areas uh, which includes all the other spaces so it could be common living spaces could be a uh, parking garage outdoor lighting the associated controls etc those are going to follow nearly the same mandatory requirements as we currently see under the non-res standards you know 130 so there's been very minor changes uh, with maybe the exception of secondary daylit zones have now been included in the daylighting controls. So that could impact some of your projects if you have had projects where in the past they were daylit secondarily as part of that zone and you didn't include those controls. Now they're going to be included. Okay. The power distribution system is basically the same and the except that this section just clarifies that multifamily buildings now have to comply with the applicable sections of 
the power distribution systems. And this whole section typically was under the non-res standards. So a lot of folks, I think, who are only doing the multifamily and residential perhaps didn't worry about this code section too much. You still don't have to do this for the actual individual dwelling units, but all the other common spaces now need to be included in this part of it. And this part of the code, uh, the mandatory measures now for kind of electric ready is true for the single family and now true for the multifamily projects. Where you're gonna see this on the multifamily projects is where individual dwelling units might have their individual water heater or an individual furnace, cooktop, individual dryer, also in dryers for common space. So what the code is saying is that it's okay to install gas appliances for any of these functions. However, if the gas appliance is installed, the builder has to supply the proper electric outlets, proper conduit, space in the subpanel that allows for the easy transition to electric appliances. This way it does not uh, incur a lot of costs and the uh, future owner of the building can easily start shifting that building to all electric. And what that might look like in your sub panel, for example, is you might have a 20 amp breaker that says, you know, future heat pump water heater, it's labeled there. And we've got a blank for the future 240 volt use. So those two areas in the sub panel be combined to provide um, 240 volt. And next to that water heater appliance, would be an, an outlet or a blank box that is labeled 240 volt ready. And it's gonna be within three feet of where that appliance would be located. And then the same idea follows for the furnace location, your cooktop or range location, and your dryers, whether it's in the individual dwelling unit or the dryers in the common space. And in the case of the dryers in the common space, of course, those all would be uh, pertain to their own sub panel. Okay, next. Okay, with that, I'm, unless there's any questions that apply to any of that, or if Amy wants to jump in and add anything, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Amy and she's gonna go through the prescriptive and the performance uh, kind of, well, mostly prescriptive elements of new construction and, um, we will we'll take it take it from there and i can monitor the chat and um while amy's speaking and vice versa okay perfect thanks jennifer um when there is no questions in the chat but i'm going to ask you a question just to clarify one just in case i like misheard um for ventilation for a whole house mechanical ventilation Yes. when we're providing that in dwelling units it requires testing re for in dwelling unit mechanical ventilation regardless of stories number of stories correct correct and uh there's part of the code just spells out that if you're in a dwelling unit that's three stories or less the HERS rater uh, would do the testing. And then for what we used to think of as high rise residential, so four stories or more, the installing contractor could do the testing. You could also have HERS do the testing. And there's some provision in the code that just really just spells out how you're supposed to do the testing. Now for the kitchen hoods, Specifically for the kitchen hoods, the uh, installing contractor is allowed to use that equipment and test the kitchen hoods or follow that prescriptive method. Thanks. Okay, so now that we have the mandatory measures kind of set, we're going to talk about new construction prescriptive and performance. 
performances, 170.1. I'm going to probably say one statement about performance, and what we're really focusing on is prescriptive. Um, next slide, please. So the reason why we're really talking about prescriptive is not because you all are going to be approaching multifamily new construction from a prescriptive perspective. <laughs> I would probably say 99.9% .9 of our multifamily buildings are all done on the performance base, right? So what we're really looking at here is understanding what is now included in our baseline. How should we be thinking about it? So when you're working, either doing the model yourself or working with the Title 24 consultant, you understand kind of what you're being compared against. Um, so that's really our main approach. And then really, as Jennifer um, mentioned earlier, the, the biggest change is now we're kind of merging two pieces together. So you'll see all of these elements from low rise from before residential, 2019 residential, brought into the multifamily section with sections of the code that say, and for common areas. So all of the appropriate common areas that you would associate with multifamily buildings, those are brought in now under section 170. So we're looking at multifamily buildings more comprehensively versus kind of digging into different sections of the code. So that's like, that is the most significant change that we're seeing. Um, again, we just reiterated the sections. And so what I'm going to do, and Jake, I may be like, okay, next, next, I may kind of skip us through pretty quickly. I'm going to take us through the prescriptive changes and really just highlight kind of the biggest differences because there's a lot of information here. You all are going to get the slides. You can read the code in the evening for your, you know, bedtime reading and really get into it. Um, so we're not going to get into all the nitty gritty details here. Um, so let's start with the envelope for roofing and ceiling insulation. There's really very few changes in here. We have options B and C, which existed in the 140 um, component package B or component B table, right, from our, our residential section. Um, what's now added is option D. The biggest difference to take away, and we can go through the next couple of slides pretty quickly, is that um, option B and C references our values, as you can see, and then when we look at option D, it's described with U factor, so just two different reference points here. Um, in the code in and of itself, there's really no differences. All requirements have to meet um, section 110. There are a few exceptions in terms of now we're seeing more um, systems with integrated PV. And in those cases, there are some exceptions for solar reflectance and thermal emittance. But on the whole, this aligns with our 2019. OK, next slide. So new, new table number. Kind of same information, right? Here's our option B, looking at our R values. Next slide. Option C, new table name, same values that we've seen in 2019. Um, so nothing new here. This is just our ducts in condition space and the insulation requirements for that. And then what we are seeing is option D, next slide, which is new. So this is our non-attic roof area. Um, so new table, new roof types, and this is what we're going to see in a number of these tables in the envelope section where we're bringing in different either roof types, wall assemblies, because again, we're pulling assemblies that were typically captured under our non-residential um, as we looked at multifamily as differentiating them from low rise and high rise under 2019 code and kind of bringing them into all under the kind of one umbrella of multifamily. Um, so we have our new table here, um, expanded cool roof for climate zones. And if you're doing a non-attic roof space, this is gonna be your reference table. And again, it's expressed in U factor as compared to our value for options B and C. Next slide. And wall insulation, kind of again, in our prescriptive table here, so we have our typical tables that we've seen from our component package now, right? Our wood metal frame buildings, our light mass framing uh, wall assemblies. But again, we now have two new assemblies in here for metal buildings and heavier mass walls. So 
just adding in there again, so we can be comprehensive in terms of what we may find in our different uh, multifamily buildings. Next slide. And same with floor insulation. Again, an additional line, great. This slide we put in here, there is absolutely no change from 2019 to 2022. Um, it still doesn't apply to multifamily buildings, four stories or more. The reason why I put it in is like, as we're thinking about um, performance uh, uh, compliance with the code, you're still gonna be hard pressed maybe to trade this off for three habitable stories or less. So it's just a reminder um, that it's required, that it's gonna be hard to be, uh, trade it off and that um, you will still be required HERS verification if you uh, utilize quality insulation installation. Next slide. For fenestration, again, what we have here, um, it's based on the product type and number of floors. So Jake, can you click a couple more so we get some boxes to show up, I think. So there's our product type. We have our fenestration allowance based on the window floor, window and floor area down below. And just calling out, like now we have a curtain wall and storefront um, type up there, right? So we're looking at different U factors, um, uh, visible transmittance, depending on my different product type. And then we also see, you can see in the small box there, just calling out that there's difference requirements between a number of stories. So again, you're gonna see this repeatedly through the prescriptive tables is we're looking at where things are being called out for different performance factors, different assemblies for low rise versus high rise. Um, one thing to note there at the bottom when we're looking at the minimum window to floor area ratio or minimum window to wall ratio, um, the percentages haven't changed. Um, you have to take which one, whichever is less. Um, but the one thing to note, the allowance for the west facing window has dropped. So the, for many buildings that may be a huge bonus and kind of create some more flexibility, but the other thresholds have not changed. Next slide. Um, for the opaque doors, again, in the effort of time, we were like, should we include this? Um, but knowing that you all are, can reference this later, Again, we just wanted to call out, you have your dwelling unit entry, and then, so it's a maximum U factor there. And then we're also calling out the common areas. Again, bridging these pieces together um, between what we expect to see in multifamily buildings. So on the whole, I think, as we kind of look at like the envelope in particular, it should be a lot easier to navigate the code where you're not kind of flipping back be and forth between multiple sections. Okay. So on to space conditioning, Jennifer mentioned this earlier, and this is kind of the biggest, one of the biggest changes is that now we're looking at heat pump for our baseline um, for the majority of our climate zones. So for three stories or less, you can see, and one through 15, our space conditioning is a heat pump. And 16, it can be a furnace with an AC unit. Um, if we're looking at four stories above, the heat pump is a baseline for climate zones two through 15. And then one in 16 has a dual fuel heat pump, all right? We don't have these, this is really based on dwelling units, as you can see up at the top. There's not a requirement for the common areas. And so now just as a comparison against 2019, under 2019, if you were installed electric, you were compared against electric. If you installed natural gas, you were compared against natural gas. Now under 2022, um, where you can see we have heat pump as a baseline, that's what you're gonna be compared against uh, in terms of performance under the compliance, uh, that compliance pathway. And so as you think about equipment selection and to comply with the energy budget, both for source and TDV, um, that is your reference point. So again, this is all kind of in this direction of looking toward how are we achieving our goals for kind of cleaner energy um, in our built environment. And Amy, we do have yep. one question submitted. Oh, sure. Would these be variable capacity heat pumps or traditional heat pumps? Um, you jump in. I, yeah, jump in because I don't think the baseline uh, includes a variable speed. I mean, both can comply, right? But 
what's in the yes. baseline? So the baseline is, um, so Ken, I think we would, I mean, the newer heat pumps have some variable capacity usually, mm -hmm. but it's the efficiency levels that are going to be looked at for the baseline in terms of complying. But uh, we didn't really go into too much in depth yet for performance. We're going to do this for other sessions. If they pick them up, but the like the true uh, variable capacity heat pumps and to get that credit in the performance method to take a credit on it. Um, those pieces of equipment are going to have to be registered with the CEC and there now is new code language specifically spelling out what the HERS rater has to look for and they have to go in the registry and see that it does qualify if you want that extra credit. Otherwise, it's a heat pump with a high efficiency. And it, right. you know, so Jennifer, just to reiterate, this. yeah, the variable capacity will give you credit for the higher efficiency over kind of a standard heat pump in the software. And if you wanted the kind of additional variable capacity heat pump, you have to follow the HERS verification protocols. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so for ERVs and HRVs, um, these are focused on dwelling units. Um, just as a, a key point, we're just calling out the differences again from 2019 to 2022. So in three stories or less, if you're using a heat pump for a space conditioning system, which there may be more of that, and you're utilizing balanced ventilation uh for compliance with uh your mechanical house mechanical ventilation but you're not using an erv or hrv then you have a um fan efficacy requirement of less than or equal to 0 0.4 watts per cfm so just like looking at here really looking at how to make sure we're installing efficient and effective equipment the new pieces here again are calling in for four stories or above so again it's pulling in um how do we address kind of the quote high rise um how do we address these units in for multifamily? so the first bullet point there in terms of using balanced ventilation with an erv or hrv for individual dwelling units this is this exists today under kind of the low rise calling it out to apply it to four stories or more so you have a recovery efficiency of greater than or equal to 67 percent rated at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and a, a fan efficacy of less than or equal to 0 0.6 watts per CFM. The addition here is if we're utilizing balanced ventilation, again, utilizing an ERV or HRV, but serving multiple units. So sometimes we see this in multifamily where we may utilize like a common shaft and deliver um, that mechanical ventilation using that equipment to multiple units. So you have the same requirements, the fan efficacy, instead of a threshold that you see above uh, for the individual units, it's looking, it's referencing the table for common area fans, right? Because we have multiple units, you're gonna need um, a larger draw for multiple units versus a single unit. So uh, referencing the common area fans table there at 170. And then we also have recovery bypass um, or control to directly economize the ventilation air based on outdoor temperatures. So really just pulling in this for multifamily of a system that we do see um, pretty commonly in terms of like shared ventilation systems like with a common shaft and defining those efficiency and efficacy requirements um, to ensure like our ventilation requirements are not excessive uh, to meet these requirements. Jennifer, is there anything else you want to add before I go on to the next slide? Uh, no, you covered it. That was good. Oh, other than if folks don't know what a heat recovery or energy recovery ventilation system is, <laughs> I, we do get that question. Um, so I put a little picture there on the right and, you know, I'm. I'm holding up my hands and it's like, you know, the boxes can be very in size depending on the capacity, but the, the ducts connect to it and there's 
the square filters that go in the middle. So this is a smaller size system you might see for an individual unit, but it allows the heat from the exhaust air to transfer without mixing the air, transfer into the incoming air so that it essentially raises its temperature up in the winter or cools it down in the summer. And that's where you get the energy efficiency and why it's important to have a certain recovery efficiency as well. If it doesn't recover much energy or heat, it's, it ends up using more energy in the fan than it does energy saved. So this is climate zone dependent. Again, you know, climate zones one through two and 11 through 16, this works really well. So we point it out because it does help in our climate zones, but it's not going to be a prescriptive requirement in our tri-county area. This is something you might be able to do to get extra credit in the performance method. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so we did pull in here. Um, uh, sorry, I was getting, I was reading a comment. Uh, fan systems for common areas. So there was some modifications in here. These are for common areas only with air handling units. There's limitations to the total fan power. Um, requirements for dedicated outdoor air systems. So these are really similar to what we've seen in the, what we're seeing in the non-residential requirements. The biggest thing here is um, calling out the different systems and applications to make sure we're giving credit uh, to the components that actually save energy. Again, we wanna make sure that we're delivering ventilation that does not um, ex kind of exceed the benefits. Um, there is a couple loopholes that this table has also um, looked to kind of close. One of them is that there was some thresholds in here that essentially excluded um, HRV system due to like over restrictive requirements. So the requirements are now adjusted. So HRVs are not excluded. Um, and then there was some adjustments uh, in terms of like the calculations and kind of what we're looking at um, for the effectiveness over time. Um, but this is really similar to the non-residential requirements. Again, just pulling them in here because we do have our mechanical ventilation in the common areas of the multifamily building, right? So in your entryways, et cetera. Next slide. So on to domestic hot water. Um, a couple of things here. Some has not uh, changed that much for individual dwelling units. We'll go through a slide for each of these. Um, we have our 240 volt heat pump water heater, plus some prescriptive for some climate zones or a NIA rated tier three heat pump water heater. And then you have option for gas propane instantaneous water heater. For multiple dwelling units, so um, looking at the setting the requirements if we're doing like clustered um, uh, domestic hot water. And we'll look at these kind of requirements where we're looking at um, the hot water return to the research tank and kind of what that temperature is. Um, the recirc water heater, uh, if you have a dedicated recirc water heater that it's electric, um, you have some requirements for single pass versus multi-pass uh, in terms of plumbing for efficiency. Um, looking at the primary storage tank, so it's greater than 135, and then we want that recirc loop like less than 10 degrees uh, than the primary, so we're not bringing back too hot water back to the storage tank. And we have minimum heat pump water heater compressor, um, cutoff time or cutoff temperature, really to look at where we're maximizing compressor operation and then of minimizing uh, electric resistance. For gas or propane, oops, sorry, Jake can go back one, perfect. Um, we have requirements here in terms of total input rating and efficiency thresholds or requirements for solar water heating system. Um, with minimum solar fractions per climate zone. You get a reduction there if you integrate a drain water heat recovery. And there's a restart loop unless it's less than eight units. So I've covered a lot of it. Let's go to the next couple slides and we'll kind of walk through. Um, so 
all of these are allowed for uh, individual dwelling units. Um, you can see for the 240 volt, if you're just using kind of a standard efficiency heat pump water heater um, in climate zones one and 16, it's allowed if I also include the compact hot water distribution. And then in 16, I'm also including drain water heat recovery. So that's if I'm using kind of standard federally efficient uh, heat pump water heater. If I look to a NEA rated tier three heat pump water heater, so higher efficiency, um, I should know the CFP that's required or the UEF uh, for NEA tier three. I want to say it's like 2.8 off the top of my head. I really should know it, um, but it's a higher efficiency. It also has kind of uh, the maximum decibel ratings for noise, which I think is 55 decibels. Um, there's controls in there. Um, uh, demand response capability. And so really just as we see under 2019, there's kind of putting the finger on the scale to make the selection for a NEA rated tier three heat pump water heater over other options. Um, because that just gives both the user and I think utility more flexibility. With climate zone 16, we are gonna have to add the drain water heat recovery system um, or you have option for gas. Next slide. For it's um, eight units or more, this is kind of clarifying requirements for a like clustered heat pump water heater systems. So I kind of went through this, but really kind of looking at prescriptive requirements as we are seeing more of these like central systems in the being installed, identifying prescriptive requirements to ensure higher performance, right? So we want to minimize energy use on the research loop. We want to um, make sure we have the right difference in return temperature on the research loop coming back to the, the tank uh, over the supplied temperature. Um, we're looking at the primary storage tank of greater than 135 degrees. Um, generally, right, if you think about your individual systems, you're probably without a mixing valve, you're at like 120. But as we're looking at multiple units and looking at that research, looking at what is at my uh, primary storage tank set point temperature, and then knowing it's running through my research loop to be delivered and accounting for 120 degree, you know, at the tap. And I think I covered most of these. Um, I will say we are the software today and continuing. Um, is looking to increase the capacity to model central heat pump water heater systems. Um, there still is a limit in what you can do uh, within the systems, uh, within the software. So that is continuing to grow to enable more systems to be installed and more easily show compliance. Um, that said, it's not a wide, it's not a, um, a large library of options, I would say at this point that will automatically get you compliance uh, under 2019 and it's being built out over time to improve that for 2022. Um, if you're doing gas or propane system uh, for greater than eight units, there are some requirements there, a recirculation system. The biggest change here really is that there's not a requirement for two or more research loops. That was something that was included previously. And so that is kind of out of this, uh, you know, not required. Um, so it doesn't have to be dual loop. Um, you have some total input ratings and minimal thermal efficiency of 90%, right? So we're looking at a condensing unit. Uh, with the additional contribution of solar water heating. So we can have some greater efficiency there in all of our climate zones. And again, if I add drain water heat recovery, I can reduce my solar uh, contribution. Next slide. So on lighting, there's really minor changes. Um, the dwelling unit requirements match our single family changes. So we're looking at some higher efficacy there. The common area requirements mostly match the non-residential changes. We'll look at some of the outdoor pieces where the outdoor lighting does have some calculation changes um, and sign lighting has some minimal changes. I think, let me just double check. Yeah, we'll talk about some of the um, 
area calculations for the common areas in the next slide. So again, what we're seeing in the area allowances is like number one, we're having common areas brought in here. And so we're not just looking at dwelling units, but uh, what are the appropriate kind of common areas that we'll find in multifamily are now brought into the table 170.2. Um, it's increased stringency. It's really based on LEDs. Um, and there's just some clarification on the calculation for outdoor um, uh, indoor lighting power. Um, I don't think those, this will be a significant impact on anything. There are some calculations that we can look at for outdoor lighting that may have some impact on projects, um, kind of depending on the design. And we can, and Jennifer, anything to say here on this before we go to the outdoor lighting area? Um, I would just say that the idea was that Amy's mentioned is to consolidate all the multifamily together in those three sections, 160, 170, and then 180. And so within those three sections, you'll get just about everything you need for multifamily and that it includes you know, these commonly found uh, areas that we would typically have considered non-res, which now right here in the multifamily, you can see it, comply with it, it's there, and it looks almost the same as if you had gone into the non-res and sort of just cherry picked out those areas. But now it's all in one place. So I don't really think there's gonna be too much difference in terms of the actual design or compliance when it comes to the indoor lighting. It just yeah. simplifies it now. Amy, we do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, this goes back to uh, heat pump water heating. Mm -hmm. uh, for multifamily with individual units, they must use heat pump water heating or gas tankless, no gas boilers anymore. What? So if you're looking at um, individual units, you have, and you can go back a couple slides, it, like a couple slides, just to show those options on the, there you go. So you have two options of heat pump water heaters, right, of different efficiencies, federal minimum, essentially, or NIA rated tier three or a gas or propane instantaneous water heater with an input of 200,000. So your prescriptive baseline does not include um, an atmospheric water heater. Um, it hasn't actually for a while. Um, we used to have like an 84% efficiency, I think, water heater um, if you were doing gas water heating under 2019. Um, so again, this is if you're following things prescriptively, um, where you're kind of going in performance, you're gonna be kind of trading things off. Jennifer, do you wanna to add to this, please? Also, I'm not sure from the question when you said uh, no more gas boilers, a lot of times when I'm thinking and working with a mechanical engineer, when we're using the term gas boiler for multifamily, we're thinking central, central. water heating with a boiler that is heating the hot water for the whole uh, complex. And you're still allowed to do that. This is, these things that we are talking about here is when um, a building owner decides it's most cost effective and better for their tenants to have each apartment dwelling have its own separate water heater and not have to share in a big system. And then there's some allowances where it could be like, um, uh, Amy said that blend of where you could take eight of those units or less and have them share a system. And that comes with those other uh, rules. So I hope that, I hope that answered your question. Um, yeah. Oh, you mean a and I think, oh, Okay, okay. <laughs> I think she means like an atmospheric, like 50 gallon gas water heater that we, commonly see and oh, so if if you install that in if you install that in an individual unit under 2022 you would take a big penalty hit from a performance standpoint 
you couldn't install it prescriptively. Um, but if you installed it uh, using performance pathway for compliance, you would take a huge hit. And that's true. That's true for uh, the current code as well. Right. Uh, however, when we get to the additions alterations, I don't, I don't think I specifically hit on hot water this time, but that would be the only place where you, under the current code, it's like, oh, if you have this kind of system, you can replace it with a like system. Um, that part of the code hasn't really changed. It's now they want to make sure everything is electric ready so that you when you come to swap out something you have the option of being able to put in a heat pump water heater yeah, yeah. and just one clarifying question about multi multi-family buildings in general do adjoining townhome or condos with common walls that are three or four stories fall under single family residential or multi-family residential ask that again say that again yeah sure so adjoining townhome or condos with common walls yes. that are three or four stories do they fall under single family residential or multi-family residential Multifamily, I think, is now the cutoff. It, the The way it's written is duplexes, townhomes that share walls. Multifamily is described as units that also share floors and ceilings. That's my understanding. So, yeah, so oh, likely town townhomes that are like this are going to be single family generally, right? Yes. Condos that are like this, more in the stacked situation would be multifamily. Yes. Great, thank you. Are All we right. on lighting, Amy? Yeah, I think uh, that two more slides, I think, let me see. Yeah, this, we finished Oops. this one, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Keep going forward. Two more. One more. One more. OK. Outdoor lighting. Great. Um, so again, what's been pulled in here is like, what is residential outdoor lighting and kind of getting it pulled in that it applies to the lighting that is controlled from inside the unit. So we're not looking at kind of common area outdoor lighting. Um, or you know, hallway lighting, pathway lighting. We'll talk about some outdoor lighting in a minute. There has been some changes to the zone applications um, in section 10 to 114. Really what it's calling out is we now have urban and urban clusters. So urban is moderately high. Um, I'm not sure kind of, if you look at kind of like the building types there, like how often we're actually gonna see kind of multifamily kind of falling in there. They're really high intensity commercial corridors. So maybe some, right, where we're looking at some infill, but mostly we're gonna see uh, in the lighting zone two, where it's moderate, um, where we're looking at multifamily kind of housing kind of called out there, mixed use residential neighborhoods, things of that area. So just some different definitions in the lighting zones. And then there has been some changes in the general hardscape allowances. So previously you had the area wattage, the initial wattage and the linear wattage allowance kind of calculated into, uh, included in the methodology. So that methodology, methodology has changed. We no longer have the linear wattage allowance. So you just have your kind of initial wattage allowance and then the area, right? Versus kind of the linear that's allowed on the um, exterior of the space. Um, so that's just a change in methodology. I don't know. Again, I think it will depend on kind of like what the design is, but I don't think this will be a significant impact to most projects. Um, but I'm also not a lighting expert doing outdoor general hardscape allowances for multifamily projects. So, um, but I don't think it will be a significant change. Next slide. The next couple of slides are kind of where we're seeing larger changes for multifamily. So when we have the solar, ac solar access, roof access, 
it's really an acronym that I just cannot get my, it just doesn't work. But it's really our allowable roof space. So there's not a lot of changes in here. We have this under 2019. Um, we're applying it to all of multifamily. There's been some slight modifications just so we're looking at all the roof space on covered parking areas and carports as well as the structure itself. Um, so it's what is all of that roof space that's uh, capable of supporting PV systems. And there's some exceptions in there um, in terms of where you have roof area, but you have less than 70% annual solar access. So it's not valuable really in terms of like PV, PV production. So in that case, you don't necessarily have to count that in kind of your um, accessible roof space for solar. Next slide. Um, so under 2019, we got introduced the requirement for PV, right, for low rise residential. Um, so that continues uh, into 2022. Really, we're looking at exceptions for based on cost effectiveness is kind of our biggest takeaway. Much of this, other than that, it really hasn't changed. Um, so you can see if I have a system, like based on my calculation, calculation methodology, it's less than 1.8 kilowatts DC, then I don't have to install a system. And what they're really saying is like, if that requirement is so small, it's just not cost effective. Not to say you still can't do it, not to say you may wanna do it anyway, just in terms of some of that benefit, but it's not gonna be code required just because it's a small system. And so they can't show those uh, that cost effectiveness. Um, there are exceptions for snow load. We still have the exception for less than 80 square feet contiguous. That's under our current 2019. Um, and then there's uh, some solar roof access areas defined for steep slope, sloped roofs. Um, the other piece on a call out, and this will come up in a couple of slides, is that you can look at your PV system and do that calculation. If you're also installing a battery with that, then you can reduce your system size by 25%. Um, so that's a new reduction, and we'll see why that's kind of um, called out here as we look at battery requirements in several slides. Next slide. Oh, I should hurry up, Jennifer. Sorry. Um, because we need to get to alterations and additions. I only have like three more slides. This is new, PV for four stories or more. So you have your calculation, you can see high rise multifamily is kind of called out there. Um, again, you have your adjustment factor. Um, you can do the calculation or you can do 14 watts per square foot times your um, solar access area, either one. Um, this is a change from 2019 and new requirement for high rise multifamily. So significant change that we're looking at PV in our baseline uh, for high rise. Next slide. There are some exceptions. Um, if you have a small um, solar roof access area, um, you can see the threshold <clears throat> is a little higher here. <clears throat> but again, for a small system, if I have less than four kilowatt system required, then based on my calculation methodology, then it's not gonna be required. And again, I have my 80 uh, square foot contiguous solar roof. If I have less than that area available for PV, then I'm not required to install a PV system. Next slide. All right, wrapping up on batteries for us. So again, new requirement for 2019. So we're looking at battery storage for four stories or greater. Um, so all buildings required to have PV will also have a battery storage system. It's gonna to have to comply with Joint Appendices 12. Um, so just thinking about those exceptions we saw for those uh, four-story buildings that meet one of those exceptions, then you're not gonna be kind of triggering the battery re requirement. If you do have to install PV, you will be looking at the battery uh, storage system. Um, and we're looking at minimum uh, rated energy. So our kilowatt hours, what is that capacity for that battery? We've got our equation there and our minimum rated power. So what are the kilowatts uh, capacity for that battery storage? So this is required prescriptively. Um, and now we've got like a 
one, the next slide is just on exceptions, but I don't know, and Jennifer, I don't know if you know off the hand, kind of like having this be required prescriptively, kind of what the impacts would be for a trade-off that I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how that's gonna be handled with it within the software. Um, I'll just say we'll be seeing kind of more PV and battery storage for multifamily probably moving forward. Do you have any thoughts on, on that kind of trade-off? And I'm also just cognizant of time that we should kind of move yeah, forward. We'll, it will keep going and yeah. I don't know yet. Right. There's a lot on the compliance software that is a, uh, we're learning and we're waiting. Um, so these are some exceptions. Again, so if the system is less than 15% of the size that's required at the equation, if it's less than uh, 10 kilowatt hours rated capacity um, for my battery storage, then I don't have to do it. Um, and if it's a single tenant building, that's less than 5,000 square feet for the conditioned floor area. So again, they're looking at, it's a new requirement, really looking at resiliency and um, minimizing grid peak usage, right, with this. Um, but defining exceptions for cost effectiveness um, as this gets rolled out. And let me end there, Jennifer, and I think so I can turn it over to you for additions and alterations and take us through to the end. Okay, thank you. I think, um, yeah, I think you hit on the end of that, that and just kind of make sure everyone knows that throughout the process of the energy code updates, uh, the CEC has been charged with showing that all the changes are cost effective. And so that's where that kind of cost effectiveness comes into play is if it's not cost effective, it cannot become part of that code, even part of the mandatory or prescriptive or trade-offs or anything else. So if you end up with a project where batteries are something that you end up doing, um, that should be looked at in terms of an individual project and how that individual project wants to meet its resiliency goals and how they want to purchase their power with their PVs and the battery as a backup. It should fall under those kinds of decisions. And then for additions and alterations, this has its own section, just like the other uh, the other section 160, 170, and now we've got section 180 that specifically deals with the additions and alterations to existing buildings. And some of the mandatory measures uh, that we touched in 160 apply, they're referenced in this area. Some of those prescriptive measures we just covered will apply and they're pulled into this part of the code and referenced. However, there are a few things where uh, unique to additions and alterations, they have their own prescriptive or mandatory requirement. Then they have a section 180.3 repairs, really short. It basically says, if this is a repair, just repair it. And then section 180.4 whole building, it's basically saying, if you want to take the entire building and do a performance model on it that includes the additions and the alterations, you can, you can do that in a performance method and um, do some trade-offs for your uh, overall project. And the requirements here, they really are a mix from the single family and the non-residential sections. So I'm just gonna hit on a couple of key features on the additions and a handful of features on the alterations. And the rest I suggest, if you have a project that is a significant addition alteration, you're gonna need to just go through that whole part of the code because it is really nuanced and very specific to what you might be doing. So. Uh, one change that came also under the single family was addition 700 square feet or less. They basically are going to have a different set of roof and ceiling insulation requirements for vented attics, and that's based on climate zone. And essentially, climate zones 2, 4, 8, 9, and 10, which is a lot of the ones we work in, there, that ceiling insulation got upgraded to an R38 instead of an R30. 
Okay, next slide. The indoor air quality, we hit on that as a mandatory measure. So for additions, some of this is gonna be triggered. However, the code clarifies that junior ADUs, which you can do a junior ADU onto a multifamily building, um, that wouldn't trigger the indoor air quality. And um, it would also won't trigger for uh, multifamily central ventilation calculations. And the indoor air quality trigger here is what this really means is that now for an individual dwelling, if you're going to add on more than a thousand square feet, you do have to do the calculation to meet the 62 point dash ray 62.2 ventilation. Um, for local mechanical exhaust, those things we talked in the mandatory measures for kitchen and bathroom exhaust apply, and we're going to go on to that next because it also applies to alterations. Um, for the roofs, roof replacements, main takeaway here is that roof replacements that either replace 2,000 square feet or 50% of the roof, whichever is more, you would have to comply now with the solar reflectance solar emittance you can use trade-offs with continuous exterior rigid insulation and that's based on the climate zone and the that was true under the old code but under this new code the insulation levels are higher and they've uh, outlined what now would be exempt so if you're looking at a re-roof project I would come through and double check that you're reading this section of the code. If you look at the last bullet point, um, I think that's fairly significant change for a lot of folks that we're gonna start out now with an R14 continuous insulation requirement for climate zone four and nine. So that could impact our areas, um, but there's also some exceptions to that. So that will be worth reading. Okay, next slide. Now, if you have vented attics in an alteration and you're going to be working on that roof, that ceiling, you, you start to get into that whole part of the project, you have to take a look at this new section because there is a pretty significant update, which is to say, hey, in climate zones, again, uh, four and, um, sorry, one through four and eight through 16, you're going to have to bump up that insulation to an R49. So that 49, that's even higher than just what's required prescriptively, but that's cost effective and it's assuming you're probably not able to uh improve the insulation anywhere else in that uh alteration um there are some exceptions if there's already existing insulation there's also exceptions to this if you have a very old building where you might have asbestos or you might have um like old knob and tube wiring or you've already got a high level of insulation okay next section um this section is really similar to what was also updated in the single family. And it's fairly similar to the requirements that were already in the code, except that new or complete replacement that has been defined to be a little more clear that a new or complete replacement includes um, uh, equipment that only leaves about 25 percent of the equipment behind and then if it is a new or complete replacement now we have new triggers for duct extensions it's at 25 feet instead of 40 and the leakage has to be 12 percent instead of 15 it needs to test to six percent instead of 10 percent for leakage to the outside um, this part of the code 
is for the new or complete replacement, but if you're doing other kinds of alterations, these the the uh, ventilation at 15% and 10%, I mean leakage at 15%, 10% hasn't changed. So really take a look at this section of the code if you are getting into the ductwork to figure out which part of the code you're gonna uh, is gonna apply to you. Okay, next. And similar, if you are replacing the space heating system for individual dwelling units, so then this new section of the code is also going to apply. And basically, it's a clarification on when it's okay to use ductless electric wall heaters. And we see that in our mild climates in the Tri-County area. So now they have these exceptions where it's just more clearly spelled out. And I think the one that would affect us the most or the exception that would affect us is in our climate zone six and seven. If the electric resistant space heating system already exists, you can replace it in climate zone six and seven. Otherwise, typically you're not allowed to use electric resistance heating under the prescriptive alterations. Now, if you go to performance method, you can use electric resistance heating. And we, we see that if everything else in the project is updated, and even though we weren't in climate zone six or seven, say we, I had a project in climate zone five, we were able to use the electric resistance heaters because everything else in the project got improved and it made up for that in a performance method. And when it comes to the alterations for ventilation for your indoor air quality, this, uh, they specifically are addressing what we need to do for um, ventilation heat recovery systems. And if you're going to do the entirely new or complete replacement, and again, it's defined as 75% of the ducts and associated materials replaced, so only 25% of that system is left over, then you have to meet the new mandatory measures for that in Section 160. And if you're going to alter those ventilation systems, and it is the ventilation heat recovery you also need to comply with the sections that deal with fan replacement, fan alteration, the air filters, and of course the kitchen exhaust, bathroom exhaust, and your exhaust fan replacement. Each of those have requirements. And if it's low rise res, you're gonna comply with the appendices RA 3.7, but if it's in the non-res portion or non-dwelling portion or four stories more, you're going to comply with the um, non-res NA 2.2 part of the appendices. Okay, now if you have questions, and I'm sure there will be questions on the new code, I wanted to just remind everybody that we do have the code coach service, so you can type a question, call us at that phone number, text us at that phone number, and someone will get back to you within a very um, short turnaround, and then we will start to work on your particular question and get you an answer. Okay, next slide. I am gonna hand it back over to Ian to go over some upcoming courses, and I believe we are actually out of time but if it's okay with the end, I'm happy to stay on the line for a couple more minutes to answer questions. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just run through this real quick and we can stay on for a few minutes for if there are any, any questions. Um, but again, if, if you have any like case specific questions and we don't address them today, Code Coach is definitely your resource. Um, and then we can also, you know, leave contact email if, if anyone has any follow-ups as well. Um, just wanted to note today we had AIA and ICC learning units available, 1.5 of each. Um, if for any reason we don't have your, um, your number on file from registration, please reach out to me and I can get that settled um, and we'll be sure to distribute learning units um, within probably the next day or two. 
um, coming to your inbox, we'll, we'll send you the slides, recording, and a follow-up survey um, for your reference, as well as we love all the feedback we can get. So if you have the time, we love seeing survey responses. Um, upcoming courses on the 17th, two days from now, we have the continuation of this series for non-residential projects. Um, on the 24th, 21st, we have a BPI certificate for healthy housing principles. Um, on the 22nd, a little plug to our multifamily home energy savings program, uh, the building connections, a resource to enhance multifamily building rehab projects. And then on the 30th, we have our regional forum. What is the big deal about heat pumps and electrification? Following the next day, HVAC design for code officials, ACA manuals, JD and S. Um, next slide. With that, we can take any questions um, for follow up. Again, if you have any questions for us, you can reach us at info at 3CREN.org and you're welcome to check out our website. Um, but yeah, we can, we can take any questions. We can hang out for probably five minutes or so. If you would like to, you can input them in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and we can we can kind of reverse it. And I do want to say thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. Certainly do. All right. Any questions? Last call for questions. All right, I'll be sure to include these guys' email in, in our, uh, our follow-up email today or, to, or tomorrow or Wednesday. Um, and with that, thank you all for joining and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks all, have a good day. Thanks everyone. Oh.